If you're thinking of purchasing an income property as an investment, you're going to want to do some financial analysis, some projections about the potential financial implications of owning that property. You're going to want to ask yourself questions such as, well, what is a fair price to pay for this property? Or what kind of a return can I expect from my invested capital? And to do that sort of analysis, you're going to begin, as we discussed in the previous lesson, with a process that we call due diligence. And as we discussed in that lesson, that due diligence begins with collecting data. Data about the market in which this property resides and about the property itself. The market data would include items such as market rents, competition for tenants, vacancy rates, cap rates, financing terms, and the general condition of the local economy. While the property data should include the actual lease contracts, the history of occupancy, operating expenses, and improvements, as well as your own estimates of items such as maintenance and repairs and perhaps costs that have been left unmentioned. And once we have that, we want to go on to the next step in our analysis process, which is the building of what is effectively a profit and loss statement for an income property, something that in the industry is called an APOD, Annual Property Operating Data. And we'll be talking about that a fair amount in our upcoming sessions. Now, in order to begin that APOD, that profit and loss statement, we have to be sure that we understand the terminology that is specific to real estate and real estate investing. Real estate investing, like other businesses, other professions, has its own special language, its own terms, which people who invest, people who do the lending and so on, are familiar with, are comfortable with, and all understand to mean the same thing. And it's surprising, really, how many beginning investors I've seen who don't make the effort to learn this terminology and do themselves a considerable disservice. At least two problems arise from not understanding the vocabulary. One of them, in the, in the words of Cool Hand Luke, is uh, what we've got here is a failure to communicate. If a buyer is trying to explain to a seller, for example, why the property should be worth X rather than Y, but does so with non-standard terminology, well, the message just doesn't get across. Or if you're trying to get a mortgage to finance the purchase of a property, and you make a presentation to a lender that has terms that simply don't exist in nature, at least don't exist in the business, the lender looks at you and you've just lost your credibility. So it's really important, I think, to make sure that you understand the basic terminology. And we're going to start with a, a little subset of that terminology right now, the terms that are necessary for building that APOD, that profit and loss. Okay, the first of these terms is gross scheduled income. And that's the total annual rent value of all units in the property. This amount includes the actual rents generated by occupied units as well as the potential rent from vacant units. Essentially, this is the top line on your P&L, on your, on your APOD. And by the way, this has, as several terms in, in real estate do, this has an alternative name. It's also called potential gross income. Okay, so that's our top line. The next item is vacancy allowance, which is also called sometimes vacancy and credit loss. Now, this is usually expressed as a percentage of the gross scheduled income. And as its name suggests, it's an estimate of the amount of potential income that will be lost due to vacancy. Credit loss, by the way, is when the unit is in fact occupied, but the check is no good. There's a loss there due not to the lack of occupancy, but the lack of, of good funds. So some investors do indeed prefer to call this category vacancy and credit loss allowance so that it accounts potentially for the uncollectible rent as well as the missing rent from vacant units. The third item is simply the difference between the first two. And this is called gross operating income. That's the gross scheduled income less the vacancy allowance. And this one has a second name as well. It's also very often called effective gross income or EGI. In my experience, appraisers tend to prefer the term effective gross income. Most investors tend to prefer the term gross operating income. But both terms can be used interchangeably. They mean exactly the same thing. And the short version is that this is the amount you actually collect. So this is the total potential income from the property minus what you've lost from vacancy and credit. What's left over is the actual money that comes in, which is the gross operating income. The next item, which would be subtracted from this, 
are operating expenses. And these are items such as property insurance and taxes, repairs, utilities, management fees. Now there's a more or less standard definition for operating expenses in regard to real estate. An operating expense is one that is necessary for the maintenance of a piece of real property and ensures its continued ability to produce income. There are some opportunities for confusion here that are entirely understandable because there are costs that we typically associate with owning property, but which may not necessarily be operating expenses. Perhaps the most conspicuous of these is your mortgage payment, your debt service. Perhaps the easiest way for me to try to explain that is to say you may indeed need a mortgage in order to be able to acquire a property, but you don't need a mortgage to operate a property. Therefore, it's not an operating expense. Less obvious is the fact that the interest portion of that mortgage payment is also not an operating expense. And that's particularly vexing because we know that mortgage interest is typically tax deductible, in particular mortgage interest when the mortgage is against investment property. But the fact that something is tax deductible doesn't necessarily mean that it is an operating expense. It could be an expense for tax purposes, but not something that we treat as an operating expense. In a similar fashion, depreciation is a tax deduction. It's tax deductible, but it is certainly not an operating expense. Then there's the question of capital improvements. Is something that we spend money on a repair, or is it an improvement? And that's a harder one, because to some extent, that's governed by tax law, not necessarily always by common sense. I had a student some years ago who raised a very good question with this example. He said to me, what if I own a five-story office building, and it has a single elevator in it, and that elevator dies? It's unrepairable. Isn't the cost of replacing that elevator an operating expense? Because I have to do it in order to be able to maintain the revenue from that building. My fifth and fourth floor tenants aren't going to pay the rent if neither they nor their clients can get up to the offices. Unfortunately, although that makes perfectly good sense, in fact, it's not going to work. If you have a face-off with the tax auditor, that auditor almost certainly is going to say, no, you can't treat that as a repair. It's got a long life expectancy. So perhaps the easiest way to try to understand what is likely to be legitimately an operating expense of repair versus an improvement is if it's a cost of running the property on a day-by-day -day basis. Those kinds of costs generally, like property taxes, property management, property insurance, supplies, and so on, those costs typically very clearly are operating expenses. I want to stress that this is not a semantic issue, whether something is an operating expense or not an operating expense. As we're going to see going a little further down the road here, it's really quite essential that we are consistent with our use of this definition, along with other investors, with appraisers, with lenders, because these definitions are going to lead to some key metrics which would be skewed if we didn't stick with the same definition of what is an operating expense that everyone else is using. So keep that in mind. We're going to see more of that as we go forward. The bottom line on our profit and loss statement on our APOD form that we're going to see in a while is a very important term, a very important metric called net operating income. And that is the gross operating income less the operating expenses. In other words, it's what's left over of your total potential income after all the vacancy and expense items have been subtracted. And again, I want to remind you that mortgage payments, capital expenditures, depreciation, have no impact on NOI, net operating income. So let's wrap up this collection of definitions here, if you will. We start with the top line, which is the gross scheduled income. That's all of the income that you might potentially get from the property. It includes both the currently occupied units and the, and the potential rent from the vacant units. You subtract for that what is lost to vacancy and to credit. And that gives you the gross operating income. Then you subtract all the operating expenses, and that gives you the net operating income. That's the basis for our profit and loss statement, our so-called APOD form, which is what we'll take a look at in our next session. <music>